Welcome back, everyone, to Law School Life and Beyond's Leadership Series. My name is Katya, and I am the host of this podcast. On today's episode, I am joined by Devin Olin. Devin is a 3L JD MBA student at U of T Law, and I'm really excited to have her on because it's always nice getting a fellow student on the show to talk about their experiences, what led them to law school, how their experience in law school is thus far, and especially with Devin, how the joint JD MBA program is for her. So with that... Thank you so much, Devin, for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored and flattered to be here with you. Yay. Um, My first question is always the origin story question. Uh, What made you decide to pursue a career in law? The million dollar question. Hmm. Um, What made me decide to pursue a career in law? So I think to answer that, I will actually backtrack and maybe start about, I start talking more so about uh, my path to law school. And for me, that starts with my undergrad program, which was at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study at NYU. Um, And the program was an individualized interdisciplinary study program, which allowed students to create their own academic major. And it really attracted students who are left brain, right brain thinkers. And my academic concentration was focused on how technology is really shifting and impacting the ways we do business, we interact with one another, and form personal identities. So the program was extremely unique in the sense that the courses were interdisciplinary in nature, and I was learning inside the classroom, but I also had the opportunity to participate in a lot of internships um, on the side for academic credit. So I went to Gallatin thinking I wanted to do fashion business, and the program was going to allow me to combine those two interests with uh, a rigorous liberal arts and academic foundation, which was extremely important to me. And the internships allowed me to start exploring the fashion industry from various perspectives. And I had the opportunity to hold various roles um, in different contexts. So I worked for uh, an online editorial position. I worked for an e-commerce startup, and I worked both as an intern and then full-time after I graduated, a creative agency that specialized in digital marketing for fashion, beauty, and lifestyle brands. Wow. And through those positions, I started to realize that I didn't think that this industry and all of the things that I had thought that I wanted to do were going to be things that I actually wanted to do. And it started to become clear that while it's important you know, to be interested in the subject matter and context of what you're doing, I really felt that I wanted to feel challenged and intellectually stimulated and like I was growing a lot professionally and personally. And so when I started to think about what my next move might be, while I wasn't necessarily sure long term what I wanted to do career wise... I started to think clearly about going back to school as a strategic next step. And so that's sort of how I landed on the JD MBA. I always knew I was going to go back to school. I never felt finished with school. And um, the JD MBA for me felt like a real natural extension um, of my interdisciplinary approach to learning. In addition to the fact that I knew it would be a great foundation and I just think that to answer your original question, both why I want to pursue a career in law, but also why I wanted to go to law school is because I know that a legal education is an education that sets you up to take in, distill and synthesize information in new ways to approach problem solving and take on challenges with a different mindset. It's not just an education, but I think that it really trains you to think differently Mm-hmm. And I not only notice a shift even after three years, three out of four years in myself, but I now working at a corporate law firm, I'm able to kind of observe that thinking at play with the people that I work with. And, you know, the people who have been at the law firm and practicing law for many years, it's clear that lawyers just approach problems with uh, a very optimistic and can do mindset and are trained to appreciate and look for the nuances and situations. And that's a mindset that I I really wanted for myself and valued and thought would be a concrete um, missing link. Mm -hmm. 
that's a really nice like picture that you painted of like what a legal education is. Um, I think I'm going to remember this sentence when I'm grinding through exams because that was very uplifting. That it uh, there is it is a means to an end. Like there is um, a definite benefit to this kind of an education. You're absolutely right. It's something that I'm glad I painted a, a good picture of it. It's something <laughs> that I have to probably remind myself or say back to myself also when I'm grinding through my exams. But yeah. I think that even in the darkest moments, not to say that it's so, so dark, but even in the tough moments, I always know that I'm doing this for a reason and that yeah. the education is of such value. And so it's, it's easy to kind of be in the moment, but also it's important to take a step back, I think, and remember why you're doing this and what the long-term value is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so then how was the transition from New York to Toronto? Um, like how long did you, did you take a lot of time in between your undergrad and coming into the, into law school or did you go right immediately into it? So I took a year off in between okay. and I spent most of that year in New York. I was working full time, um, in New York at the creative agency and I really, I loved being there. I just felt ultimately that it wasn't what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. but the transition was, it wasn't bad. And I think that's because it was really a choice for me. Okay. It wasn't by force. It was mm. something that I actively wanted to do and sought to do. And when I think about the transition and what that looked like, even though it was a choice and I, I think it was pretty easy, there were obviously, there were big changes that took place, not only going from working full time back to school, but also going from living in an apartment with a roommate and being extremely independent to moving back home with my family mm -hmm. and all five of us under one roof and who could have ever predicted that this pandemic would have happened and we would all be very much under one roof on top of one another. But yeah. I think that moving back in with my family, even though it was part of the transition, was something that was way more a blessing than it was a curse mm -hmm. because you know, New York is an incredible place. It can be so empowering. It um, forces you to be by yourself a lot and learn to enjoy being by yourself. But at the same time, it can be incredibly lonely and isolating at times. And so even just to be at home with bodies on the other side of the couch who you don't have yes. to talk to, but who are there, and not only who are there for me, I'm fortunate. Like, I love my family. We, they're my people. They support me. Mm -hmm. They... Um, are my shoulders to cry on and my advice and my sounding boards. And also I'm fortunate enough to like have dinner on the table and I not have to go grocery shopping. And those yeah. are huge perks when you're in one L and also in the first year of the MBA where you barely have time to breathe. So mm -hmm. in that sense, um, having my family was for sure a blessing as part of the transition. But I think, um, the other part of the transition that I would speak to was just also the difference in academic programs that I had experienced. My undergrad True. was, as I already kind of mentioned, very individualized and very interdisciplinary. And the program was intimate. The courses were seminar style. Every kind of evaluation that I did was pretty much a paper, which I could write on a topic of my choosing. I developed really close relationships with several of my professors who I still keep in touch with to this day and going from that to law school where I was an extremely small fish in a big pond and in a program that was far more prescribed and you know learning a language which felt completely foreign to me was definitely I think the biggest culture shock of the transition Mm -hmm. from and, and it's not even a transition from New York to Toronto in terms of cities it was just a transition like part of the transition from undergrad to law school. So mm -hmm. I think that to me sticks out the most. But in retrospect, when I think about it, I think a lot of the independence that I practiced and cultivated, not just living in New York, but being in my undergrad program, helped give me the confidence to approach what was a very hard transition academically with, um, yeah, with a lot more confidence and, and knowing that even if I didn't know what I was doing, and I still often don't know what I'm doing, I know that I'm somebody who can develop processes and has, mm -hmm. a, you know, a mindset of this is going to be okay, because I will make sure it's okay. And I will get things done as and, and 
I will accomplish all that I need to in my own way, in my own time. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a really, really good point. Just having those experiences, being independent just gives you that confidence to know, like you said, this is going to be fine. I'm going to get this done. I've got it done before. It's not pretty right now, but it will be fine. (laughs) Yeah. And it's always when you're in the moment, Mm -hmm. you don't feel that way necessarily all the time. But when I think back about each thing that was difficult for me, Um, and each, obviously each time you go through something tough and you get through it, it's only another experience under your Mm -hmm. belt to then reflect back on for when you come to the next hard time and be like, Mm -hmm. well, I got through the last one. I got Mm -hmm. through the criminal law exam. So I'm going to get through (laughs) the next exam. Exactly. Yeah. And then how has the, how has your experience been doing the joint JD and MBA? My experience has been fantastic. I think that it's been really great to do the joint degree and to do them simultaneously. So I'm not sure if it's like this at other schools, but at U of T, you do 1L and then you do your first year of your MBA and then you do a combination of both for your upper two years. And I think that while it's definitely a lot at times and you're you're balancing a, a heavy course load. I think it's for sure nice to have the balance of both at the same time in the upper two years because you really do start to see the synergies in the different subject matters that you're learning. And I think, you know, in addition, the law program is structured in such a way where you're taking these semester long courses and it's much more of a slow burn towards 100% finals or 100% papers. And it's, it's also mainly independent learning and study. Whereas in the MBA, it's constant deliverables and it's a lot more team-based evaluation. So I think that, again, while it can be a lot to juggle, it's nice to have the balance at the end of the day because mm-hmm. You're, you're forced to stay on the ball and you're also forced to consider what you're learning in both places and, and how they interact and relate with one another. Um, I also think that I would be remiss to not mention the people. And I think, you know, the greatest part of being in this program is meeting all of these incredible people who are really interesting, diverse, bright, come from all walks of life. Um, I have a, I feel like I have a huge network and it's not just a network to tap into, but I think I just also have great, made great friends and people who I'm going to be able to have at my disposal for the rest of my life, which, um, is incredible. And I'm so fortunate to have, and I think, you know, whether it's from my first year of law school or the first year of the MBA, or even in my cohort of JD MBA dual degree peers, I'm really lucky to be surrounded by such talented, smart, um, cool, fun people. So mm-hmm. I think that's that's been for sure the highlight of the experience. Okay. And how many people are in the joint JD MBA with you in your year? In my year, I think there are around 25 of us. And if I'm not mistaken, okay. it was the largest JD MBA class and the largest cohort of female JD MBA students Nice. that they've had, which I feel very proud to be a part of. Yeah, that is awesome. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's really cool. And I think having an MBA makes you so much more marketable with a law degree as well, because you get the nuances of the business end. Um, because there is a business end to law that I think a lot of people don't take into account. I've learned a lot from the guests that I've had on the show that they've always mentioned the legal field is a service-based industry and people forget that. And But it is a service-based industry. These are clients that you need to take care of that they need to feel that they're being taken care of and with that comes how do you run your business and so that MBA will be invaluable I think in your career for sure and I think whether it's even the you know tangible subject matter whether the fact that I know what a bond is or I've seen a balance sheet before and so when I'm I'm working at a corporate law firm and when I'm on a deal not all of the terms are or not the the context is yeah it's not totally foreign to me but I think even Putting that aside, going back to what I said before about the difference in the way that the programs are structured, having the opportunity to work in teams versus independently is very applicable to a law firm setting Mm -hmm. where 
you know, yeah, you are maybe a lawyer doing a lot of independent work, but you're constantly liaising with your colleagues on a file. And it's a very social profession. And so I think mm-hmm. that having the opportunity to work in teams in school is also a value add to, you know, the, just the pure JD degree. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. And then my next question is why did you, or what prompted you to start the Law Film Society at U of T? So what prompted me to start the Law Film Society? Well, I love movies. I've always loved movies. It's very natural for me to connect with people about film, music, TV, pop culture. It's probably one of the first questions that I love to ask people upon meeting them. And I've particularly always loved movies that have law-related themes, whether it's a legal thriller or Mm -hmm. a courtroom drama, that kind of thing. My two friends and I, who I met in 1L, constantly talked about and recommended legal films to one another. And during the pandemic, I became particularly invested in working my way through my list of films that I had yet to see. And we had talked about starting this club before, but we felt that during the pandemic, actually, it was a prime opportunity to start it because it was not only a club that we could run in a remote environment, but it was certainly a way to just stay connected with people um, during a particularly isolated time. We also thought it would be really nice for incoming students who we you know, anticipated having a lack of connection, mm-hmm. and we wanted to help be a part of fostering a community for those students at the law school and give them a little bit of a taste of what we had experienced in our first year. And so all of those things, I think, are the reasons why we started the club, and it was pretty much just a natural extension of our, our own love of legal films. Okay. And then, so how does it work? Do you guys all watch movies together or, um, like remote, obviously how how did, yeah. What are the logistics of this club? Yeah. So we started the club, as I said, during the pandemic. And so we didn't have the opportunity this year to have in-person screenings, but we would pick a, a film and we would usually try and pick a film and center on one of the themes of the film. And we would follow up that viewing with an event. So we'd ask people to watch the film and come to either what was a book club kind of discussion of the film or an event of some kind. For example, we had a panel discussion on the film, The Trial of the Chicago 7, which included one of our professors and a judge and a member of the Movement Defense Committee. And we also had a an event which consisted of Jeopardy and Trivia based on Aaron Brockovich, which is my personal film of choice. Mm -hmm. Um, And we just, it was just a nice way for, you know, professors and students to come together and interact. That was, I think, one of our, our greatest takeaways of starting the club was having the opportunity not just to interact and meet new students, interact with and meet new students, but to interact more casually with our professors when, mm-hmm. you know, you couldn't go to office hours. In, even if you could go to office hours, I feel like a lot of students maybe would be too shy to go to office hours, but still wanted to have kind of form a relationship with some of their professors. And so it was really nice to have this outlet to connect with some of the professors on a more casual level. Um, mm-hmm. And I think this coming year, we are hoping that we'll be able to have some in-person screenings because I think our vision overall for the club was to all gather around, watch the movie, and have the event take place, whatever it may be, immediately after a screening, which mm-hmm. would hopefully involve popcorn and snacks and yeah. beanbag chairs or whatever else we can get our hands on to make it, you know, uh, an intimate, cozy vibe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or I was going to say, you should rent out a movie theater and see if they'll show oh, your that movie. Would be great. That'd be so fun. Such a good idea. Noted. Writing yes. it down. We'll have to credit you. Oh, you'll have <laughs> to come. I'll just come. There we go. Yeah. I'll just perfect. Yeah. Um, that is a really cool, a really cool club. That That is awesome. And then, so now do you have people like one L reps, two L reps that you're going to have to kind of fill those positions. So it carries on beyond your graduation. Exactly. So we had reps in every year. We also had somebody helping out with social media this year. And I think going forward, we want to maintain the positions that we had, but also perhaps bring someone on to deal with or to be, I guess, a treasurer of sorts and um, 
especially if we are hoping to have in-person events, which would involve a bit more budgeting and yeah. requesting of funds. Um, but yeah, I think that was also such a nice part of starting the club because we, we had these reps who we engaged in the different years. And I think we were our own little community um, it's the greater community. And mm-hmm. um, I I hope that, you know, we were able to kind of be a source for them as much as I felt that they were a nice source of, you know, community for us. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you were. And that sounds like a really cool club. That's awesome that you guys put that together. Thanks. There's actually awesome. a, a course that's going to be offered in the fall. Really? It's called Law and Film. Mm-hmm. Are Which, you taking it? <laughs> I mean, I haven't found out what course I got into, but it was number one on my list. I felt like it was meant to be. That it was is meant basically to be. made for us. Yeah. Y- yes, you need to have words with admin if you do not get into that club or into that I class. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. So, can you also describe your experience with the 2L recruit? For sure. So, I think I should preface this by saying that I participated in an entirely virtual recruit. So, mm. I. All of my insights will be coming from that perspective, and I obviously have no um, other base to compare it to. But Mm -hmm. I think that reflecting on the process as a whole, the anticipation was far more stressful than the actual experience was. Mm -hmm. I definitely invested a lot of time and effort to prepare for the process and during the process itself, but I think one of the best parts of the recruit is getting to meet and interact with so many new and interesting people. Mm -hmm. I obviously appreciated this even more so during the pandemic when I was isolated from everyone. Mm -hmm. So having a week where I could meet so many new people at once was quite honestly refreshing. Yeah. Um, I think another big takeaway about the recruit in terms of overall experience was how much I felt a generosity of spirit and camaraderie within the community. I think I was blown away by how willing people are to spend their time to lend their perspective, advice, mentorship. I felt extremely supported by people that I had known, but also those that I had just met who, you know, were just there for me and willing to invest their time to help me find my way. And so as a result, I feel compelled to pay that forward. Mm. And I think, you know, that that speaks to the the process and, and honestly how enjoyable it is in some ways. I think in terms of learning, one of my greatest takeaways was that it's important to take the time to reflect deeply mm on what's most important to you when you're applying Mm -hmm. to these firms and what's most important about a place where you might like to work. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, I think it's critical to spend the time to come up with thoughtful questions, which will help you uncover the information you need to make your decision. Mm -hmm. And as a follow-up to that, I think it's important to be creative in the ways that you seek out information and to remain really observant. Mm -hmm. And I think originally some of the more concrete aspects of the summer programs were what I thought would help me distinguish the different firms. But I think it ultimately became clear as I moved through the process that it was the more subtle and nuanced differences in the cultures, which were paramount for me. And I think I took a lot of care to watch how people interacted on Zoom calls, at social, the virtual social events, even how they communicated over email, mm-hmm. hoping that by observing these forms of interaction, I might replicate in some sense what I might have observed when two people passed each other in a hallway. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, I also really got a flavor for the different firms in terms of how they handled the process. You know, were they transparent? Were the interactions that I witnessed genuine? Were the Mm -hmm. events casual, lighthearted, fun? Was it clear that the lawyers were genuinely enjoying themselves? Because I think it was quite transparent when lawyers were happy to be there, were excited to see their colleagues on the screen who they hadn't seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, And and those were the kinds of things that stuck with me and ultimately helped me determine where I wanted to be. 
what were some of the thoughtful questions that you kind of came up with that helped you kind of deduce that information that you needed? So I think that you have to be, as I said, thoughtful Mm -hmm. about what you're asking and strategic too Mm -hmm. about when and what you ask. Mm -hmm. But I also think you shouldn't shy away from asking things that are genuinely important to you. For example, when I was going through the recruit, there was a lot of stuff going on in the news about the unequal pay for female lawyers on Bay Mm -hmm. Street. And it was definitely, you know, the elephant in the room, but something that I felt was extremely important to me Mm -hmm. to understand a firm's perspective on what was going on and and what kinds of initiatives they're taking to support female lawyers, not just in terms of compensation, but in terms of concrete action items to propel women forward Mm -hmm. in the workplace. And so during the infirm week, I would ask the lawyers, you know, what do you think about what's going on in the news and and what kinds of things does the firm do to support its female lawyers? Mm -hmm. And I would ask that question, not only of female lawyers, but also of male lawyers, because it was important for me to understand everyone's perspective. Mm -hmm. And And I think that question was something that I, you know, was definitely not on my list of prepared questions going Mm -hmm. into OCIs. I mean, it was very timely, of course, too, but I, I, it was, it was beyond just, you know, the classic, like, how do you support female lawyers? It was really rooted in current events and what was actually happening on Bay Street. And I, I wanted to hear firsthand from, you know, the people on Bay Street about what their reaction is and what the firm is doing to hopefully improve the situation moving forward. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that that is a really good way to prepare for OCIs is to just really think critically about what is important to you and then going into the process with that lens and just kind of picking up those, like you said, subtleties in different firms. And I, th- I think that's awesome advice. Thanks. I mean, I also think, you know, listen and listen to what people are saying to you when you're being interviewed, because as much as, as much as it's an interview, it's also a conversation. And yeah. I think that you'll, you'll be surprised at how naturally questions come to you too, when you are just listening to what people are saying to you in response, because you're, if you are a naturally curious person, you're going to pick up on something that somebody's saying and want to learn more. And I think you should never be afraid to go off the cuff. And I also think that those kind of questions are probably the ones that are most important to you because they're coming from a place of genuine interest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's awesome. And so aside from that advice, do you have any other advice for future or current law students? Sure. Even though I feel like I probably need to take my own advice still, Mm -hmm. uh, I think I would firstly say reach out and connect with people. Because Mm -hmm. as I've alluded to, I think that this community is really warm. And I think people are really willing to lend their time to help. Mm -hmm. I think despite also the stereotypes that may persist, I've not experienced a cutthroat or competitive environment at law school or at the law firm that I'm working at. I think people are really open, eager to learn from and with one another. And I think if that's not your experience, then the good news is that you are in a really big pond and there are other fish and that you will find people who, for whom that is their experience or for whom they wish that to be their experience. So Mm -hmm. seek out those people. I think another piece of advice I would give is that you should expect to feel like you are an alien. Again, the good news is that you are surrounded by many other aliens. And (laughs) I think that... Fear, (laughs) nausea, anxiety, panic are all things that are on the menu with starting Mm -hmm. a program of this nature. You should be prepared not only to feel those things, but to learn a a new language and to feel like a complete imposter. But Mm -hmm. that is the most normal. And I can't say that it totally fades, although you definitely feel more comfortable over time. Mm -hmm. I think another piece of advice is to take good care of yourself. Mm -hmm. physically, mentally, spiritually, in the ways Mm -hmm. that work best for you. And I think, you know, for me, some things that have worked are ensuring that I stay active, that I eat properly, that I get sleep, that Mm -hmm. I get outside, that 
I, you know, I, I've tried to implement weekly rituals, whether it's honestly putting on a face mask twice a week, taking a bath, mm-hmm. journaling, sitting down, listening to my favorite artist or mm-hmm. the new album that came out, um, lighting a candle, making my space feel comfortable, mm-hmm. and then carving out time for things that are important to you. And again, for me, that's spending time with my family, going for dinner with my grandparents, seeing my friends, and also just making time for myself. Because in reality, that is something you have to make time for. Mm -hmm. And so I think my last piece of advice and related to that point is that you have to set boundaries and you have to honor Mm -hmm. yourself. And you need to really develop clarity on what you want to say yes to and what you want to say no to. And, and that's true, not just for the program itself, but for all aspects of the journey. It was true for me when I was doing my applications, when I was going through the recruit on Mm -hmm. a daily basis, when I'm in class, when I'm working on assignments or when I'm, um, you know, applying for summer jobs. And I think this program, whether it's law or the JD MBA is extremely rigorous and no one's going to set limits for you. And so this is something that Mm -hmm. I definitely am still learning and practicing, but it's, I think, a huge piece of advice that I would give to others. Mm -hmm. I think that is excellent advice, just setting those boundaries. And I think your advice kind of boils down to just really knowing yourself and being introspective through the OCI process. And then just general advice, what you're saying is you really just need to take a second, figure out what's important to you and then advocate for yourself. And I think that that is awesome advice. Thank you. And I think you summarized it perfectly and you are, you must be a law student with that synthesis. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks. Um, I have one more question. What is your definition of success? Like what, what does success look like to you? Cause I think that's uh, along the line of what you're saying that you really need to be introspective about what's important to you and not kind of get caught up in the noise that is law school. So what, what does that look like to you? I guess it's a very hard question to define, but I think my immediate reaction to what is my definition of success is that success is waking up every day and feeling fulfilled and like I'm constantly learning. Mm -hmm. I never want to feel like I'm stagnant. Mm -hmm. I want to feel like I'm constantly challenged and adapting and growing both mm-hmm. personally and professionally. And I think that goes back to even my answer to your first question about what inspired me to come to law school. And mm-hmm. it's a desire to constantly better myself and challenge myself. And I see that as a state of success for me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Devin, for coming on the show. It was so nice chatting with you. I cannot wait to air this episode. Thank you, Katya. It was so wonderful to meet you, chat with you, and thank you so much for having me. And that concludes today's episode. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in, as always, and be sure to tune in next week for Law School Life and Beyond's next episode of the Leadership Series.